This is an El Camino. <laughs> That's Spanish for the Camino. Back in 1959, Chevrolet introduced the El Camino, a pickup truck based on their Brookwood wagon platform, in response to the Ford Ranchero that was introduced two years earlier. After a slow start that resulted in its cancellation after just two years, GM relaunched the El Camino in 1964 as a cousin to the Chevelle, and sales soon took off, beating the Ranchero in popularity, especially with the high-performance El Camino SS. But by the 1980s, even with the Ranchero no longer for sale, Chevy's new compact S10 pickup would soon take a serious bite out of El Camino sales, leading to its end in 1987. This is the story of the Chevy El Camino. This is my old car. You just sold your soul for a car. Who cares, Fez? Your soul is like an appendix. I don't even use it. <laughs> Car-based utility vehicles first existed as far back as the 1920s, when all vehicles were body on frame, and therefore could easily be adapted to have a truck bed in the rear. But later, as car and truck platforms diverged, pickups stayed on truck platforms. That is, until Ford released their Ranchero in 1957, which was a radical idea for the time. Look, it's more than a car. Look again, it's more than a truck. It's the new Ford Ranchero. Look, sleek as any show pony, it rides and handles like a car. The Ranchero was based on the Ford Fairlane, which itself may be most famous for its hardtop convertible option. The Ranchero's success forced GM to quickly convert one of its models, the Brookwood Station Wagon, to become the new El Camino. GM even copied Ford's naming convention by using a Spanish name. Whereas Ranchero is Spanish for rancher, El Camino is Spanish for the way. That's Spanish for the Camino. The Brookwood Station Wagon was itself based on the 1959 Chevy Bel Air and Impala models, which were most distinctive by their sideways fins in the rear. These same fins remained in the El Camino's tailgate, and the floor of the bed was steel which differed from the wood floors used in other GM pickups up to that point. In fact, since the platform was based on the Brookwood station wagon, the footwells for the rear seats still remained under the bed floor. The El Camino also differed from the Ranchero in its rear suspension. Whereas the Ranchero had heavy-duty springs to absorb a heavy load, the El Camino had a system called Level Air, which kept the bed level when empty, but then adjusted accordingly for a heavy load. Unfortunately, it wasn't always reliable, and most 1960 models had this feature removed. Engine options were an inline six cylinder as base, or two V8s, the strongest one being a 5.7 liter that made 335 horsepower. Although the 59 El Camino sold better than the Ranchero, sales dropped by over 50% for 1960, dropping it behind the Ranchero. As a result, GM decided to pull the plug early, so there was no 61 model. That would have been the end of the El Camino if it wasn't for the introduction of the mid-sized Chevy Chevelle for the 1964 model year. GM decided to rework the two-door Chevelle wagon chassis to fit a truck bed, resulting in a far different look from the 59 and 60 models, as the fins that were synonymous with the 1950s were now gone from all cars. The El Camino differed from the Chevelle in engine options, as the El Camino's more utilitarian purpose meant it didn't offer the big block V8 from the Chevelle Supersport. Better known as the SS, this engine option was not officially available in the El Camino, although some El Caminos from those years that are still around today may have been upgraded as anything made for the Chevelle could pretty much work with the El Camino. Because of their close association, visual changes to the Chevelle carried over to the El Camino, such as facelifts done in 1965, 66, and 67. Hey, Leo, man, there's a car in here. It's an El Camino. Oh. Well, do you think it's mine? <laughs> Sales of the El Camino average around 35,000 each year for those four years, good enough to allow the El Camino to continue with the next generation Chevelle that began in 1968. Third gen El Caminos, along with their Chevelle cousins, took on a new look that, at least to me, is what looks like a classic El Camino that I remember as a kid. This generation is often considered the best looking El Caminos, and the most powerful, as the SS396 engine option from the Chevelle was officially available on the El Camino for 1968. And by 1970, the largest available was the LS6454 rated at 450 horsepower. However, in 1971, with new regulations that switched cars to requiring unleaded gas, the highest horsepower option was dropped, and the remaining engines had smog pumps added to reduce emissions, which in turn dropped horsepower. But this didn't hurt sales, as by 1972, the El Camino had its best sales year, with over 57,000 sold, which was over 16,000 more than the previous year. Considering General Motors' GMC brand only sold trucks, they wanted a piece of the action too. So for 1971, 
GMC introduced a new model called the Sprint, which was simply a rebadged El Camino. If you remember the Chevy subcompacts from the 80s, the Sprint name may sound familiar, but clearly not anything like the first GM vehicle to have the name Sprint. Only the badging made the Sprint any different than the El Camino. It simply existed to allow GMC dealers to get some of the El Camino sales. There was even a Sprint SP, which was just another name for the El Camino SS. With the redesign of the Chevelle for 1973, the fourth gen El Camino was also redesigned to match. One key difference between the third and fourth gen El Caminos was the placement of the tail lamps. Whereas previous models had the tail lamps on either side of the tailgate, the fourth gen had the tail lamps down in the bumper. I remember seeing these as a kid and wondering even at that young age, why would anyone put tail lamps right where they could be damaged if they were bumped from behind? Apparently it wasn't much of a concern as tail lamps remained in the bumper for the remainder of the El Camino's run. 1973 was also the beginning of the oil embargo, which likely played a role in the Chevelle losing its SS option after that year. Yet surprisingly, the El Camino continued to offer that option beyond 73. The new design, which included an option for swiveling bucket seats, was a hit with consumers. Now that's comfort. And led to its best sales year at almost 65,000 sold. But the oil embargo of 1973 forced a decrease in the output of the V8 engines, which got so bad by 1975 that the largest V8 a 454 cubic inch 7.4 liter could only make 215 horsepower. Not surprisingly, this largest engine wasn't even available in California. A facelift in 1976 resulted in vertically stacked quad headlamps, a look that was becoming common across other GM models. The largest V8, now at 400 cubic inches, only made 175 horsepower. And by 1977, the 400 cubic inch engine was gone. Yet despite the lower engine output, they still sold over 54,000 that year, proving that a truck that looks like a car was still a popular option, more popular than Ford's Ranchero, which ended by 1979. By 1978, GM began a downsizing across all of its model lines, which resulted in the end of the Chevelle, being replaced by the Malibu, which also began GM's transition to a body style that all automakers eventually did as well, boxy. All the front end sheet metal, as well as the doors, on the 5th gen El Camino was shared with the Malibu. The new Chevy El Camino. Who'd have thought a pickup could look this good? GMC still offered a rebadged model, but the name changed from Sprint to Caballero, clearly an attempt to match Chevy by using a Spanish name. Caballero roughly translates to Knight, as in K-N-I-G-H-T, which may be related to a special edition Chevy offered for the El Camino in 1978, the Black Knight. The Black Knight Edition was, of course, black, but also had a huge gold decal on the hood, an obvious ripoff of the Pontiac Trans Am Screaming Chicken logo, which were hugely popular in the late 70s. Unfortunately for GM, they didn't realize that the name Black Knight was already in use by Marvel Comics, who quickly sued GM for copyright infringement. So for 1979, the Black Knight model was changed to Royal Knight, where it remained an option until 1983. Only around 1,200 Black Knights were ever made before the name change. Another popular option was the Conquista trim, which offered a three-tone paint job that made it look more upscale. The Conquista was popular enough to last through the final model year of 1987. With the second gas crisis at the end of the 70s, engine sizes continued to shrink, with the largest available engine, a 350 cubic inch 5.7 liter V8, only making 155 horsepower, and the base V6 engine only making 115. For 1982, along with a new grille that made the El Camino look a lot like a Chevy Caprice up front, Oldsmobile's infamous diesel V8 was an option, and although it offered better mileage, it was an expensive option that ultimately would become even more expensive thanks to so many repairs these engines required as they aged. If you wanted your El Camino to look faster than it was, starting in 1983, a new appearance package was available from an aftermarket company called Choo Choo Customs from Chattanooga, Tennessee. This upgrade provided a more aerodynamic front end to match the similarly styled Monte Carlo as well as aluminum wheels and side exhaust skirts. Although this appearance package also included SS decals, not all the conversions were actually done on SS models. By the end of 1983, Chevrolet ended production of the Malibu, replacing it with the new front-wheel drive Chevy Celebrity. The Celebrity was among the cars that shared the new A-body platform, which was the same letter the El Camino once had, so rear-wheel drive cars like the El Camino were reclassified as G-body. Despite the end of its Malibu cousin, the El Camino soldiered on, although sales were slowly dropping each year, with just over 21,000 for 1985. One major factor was Chevrolet creating its own competition, its new S10 compact pickup. Although the S10 was a true pickup truck in the sense that it had a separate bed and cab and was not on a car platform, 
Its compact size and affordable price made it a decent alternative to the El Camino. By 1987, with sales dropping to lower than the El Camino had in 1960 when it was canceled the first time, the second and final cancellation occurred that year. The similar looking Monte Carlo, at least those with the aftermarket aero front end, ended a year later. The El Camino outlasted the Ranchero, which although had started the truck that looks like a car segment, ended in 1979. It also far outlasted Chrysler's attempt at a similar truck, the Dodge Rampage, which was based on the Dodge Omni and only lasted from 1982 to 84. The closest competitor that still remained after the end of the El Camino was the Subaru Brat, which lasted from 1978 to 1994 although Subaru put jump seats in the bed to get it reclassified as a passenger car to avoid higher tariffs imposed on truck imports. If you saw my first sales flops episode, you may recall I featured the Chevy SSR, a retro-styled convertible pickup. I had at least one viewer point out that I failed to mention the El Camino as the inspiration for the SSR. In fact, Wikipedia shows the SSR as the El Camino's successor. Considering there was over 15 years between the two, calling the SSR a successor to the El Camino is a bit of a stretch. Although when compared with the El Camino SS, I can see the connection there. But considering the SSR's short lifespan, it was another example that the car-based pickup idea had lost its appeal, at least in North America. Former GM subsidiary Holden once sold a vehicle called the Ute in Australia, which I know many had wished GM had imported to the US, and it almost happened as a variation of the Pontiac G8. But budget cuts, along with the end of Pontiac, prevented the Ute from making it stateside. All new Holden Ute. Go harder. With the failure to get the Holden Ute to be imported to the U.S., there hasn't been a car-like pickup in the U.S. for a couple decades. However, car-based pickups are available today, such as the Ford Maverick, which shares a unibody car-like platform with the Ford Escape, and the Hyundai Santa Cruz, based on the Hyundai Tucson, another crossover on a taller car platform, not a traditional body-on-frame pickup. Since most everyone wants a crossover nowadays, seeing a pickup in the shape of a traditional car seems highly unlikely making cars like the El Camino a rare treat to see on the road today. Thanks for watching. I was going to give this car to my son on his 16th birthday, but then my old lady took him and split. Yeah, wow, well, say sorry, keys please? <laughs> if you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. He's the son I never had. You just said you had a song! <laughs>